So the other day, my daughter was fighting with her best friend at my house, and it was really funny, um, you know, which is super rare if you know Olive. Um, but she's there, and uh, what happened was her, she wasn't sharing her toy, so the girl comes in and says, hey, you, Olive's not sharing a toy. And so I said, okay, I'll go talk to her right now. And so I kinda was going to see if they could like resolve it themselves, right? But I guess she went back and reported the news. Your dad said, you're in trouble, all right, which didn't fully say, but that's fine. Um, and then Olive comes in, and all, so Olive swings the door, runs in, and is like, it's not true. And I'm like, what's not true, right? And so we're going back and forth, and, and she's going, well, I told her she could use it. Da, 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 da. She's kind of giving her case. And there was this, this funny moment where um, I said, baby, look, I, I don't even care, honestly, this just happens in relationships, and God wants us to love each other. So, so let's, just, let's just make sure we can work it out. Just love each other, okay? That's all I care about. Can you just, and, and this is literally what Olive said, it's hard to love people when you're right. <laughs> I said, daughter of Emily, <laughs> you listen up, all right? So then I'm like, baby, it's fine. Like, it's okay, honey. I couldn't even believe she was saying this. She's five years old, man. I couldn't even believe she was saying this, right? And I'm like, baby, I just think you guys just had a misunderstanding. And she, as she's walking away, she says, well, I think she got carried away. And she, I was like, man, who is this girl, right? But it, it was so funny because uh, it was just such a clear picture to me of how we're all born wanting to defend ourselves and justify ourselves. Like, we do something wrong, and, like, we have reasons why that was cool. It actually wasn't bad, and it wasn't as bad as you thought it was. It was actually not that bad at all. In fact, you're the bad one, right? We have so many, uh, so much defensive, self-justifying um, posture towards life. Like, that's just kind of our, our MO. It's just how we're born out the womb, defending and justifying ourselves constantly. So you st- if, if you stand up, go to the kitchen, someone takes your seat. You come back, hey, that was my seat, man. What are you doing? Oh, well, you didn't call it. Who made up that rule? Um... And then someone else gets up and goes to the restroom, so you take their seat, and they come back in, hey, you took my seat, you didn't call it, and like, breaking the rules we just set up for someone else, and yet we're self-justified to the fact they took ours, and so now we get to take yours, and we do all this weird stuff where we have this posture of um, self-justification. And the Bible says that uh, that's because inside the, the default posture of the human heart is what we might call... Um, self-righteous or self-justifying or um, it seeks to prove its own righteousness. What, what I mean by that, and the Bible would call this the law, is the law says, um, look at yourself and how good you are and that proves that you're a person of value. And so if the human heart is just naturally built on self-justifying and defensiveness, um, it's really hard to believe a message that the Bible preaches called the gospel, which is that you actually are not righteous, but God has sent his son Jesus to forgive you of that and to fill you with his power so you can become righteous. Like that, that's, a, that's a really humbling message to believe. And by the way, that is the whole point of the Bible, that God has gifted you his righteousness. And so whereas the law is, what are the good works that I can do? The gospel is the good news of what God has done. Whereas the law is, I need to justify myself by doing good things. The gospel is, God has justified the unjustifiable by forgiving and empowering them. Whereas the law is, I can earn my place in God's family. The gospels I've received as a gift, my status and my place in God's family. Or as the law is a contract where it says, God, you owe me because I've done good things. Now I'm going to put you in my debt. The gospel is a covenant where God gives himself to us and we can never repay him. And, and I bring this up at the front end here because that's kind of what we talked about last week. How there's really two ways to try to approach God. It's that self-justifying default human heart that we all have. Or there's this radical reorient, reorienting way of trying to approach God Not by what we can do, but by trusting in what Jesus has done. And so the law says, do this, and it's never done. The gospel says, believe this, because it's been done already for you. And those are the two approaches to God. And everyone in this room, you are coming to God based on your own efforts or on the work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can try to get to God. And one way you know how this plays out in your life is if you stand before heaven 
and, and, and you stand before God in heaven, and he says, why should I let you in here? If there's a party that says, well, because I'm a good dude. That would be law-based self-justification. You're pointing to yourself as the reason why you think you deserve access into God's eternal home. Whereas every Christian knows that ain't going to fly. Our righteousness is paper thin. And at the end of the day, there's a ton of evidence that we actually don't measure up. But the good news is God has done something in Jesus to forgive us of that. And so we can actually plead guilty and throw ourselves in the mercy of Jesus. And God will widely and thoroughly embrace us. And, and Paul talked about this last week, about the difference between the achievement righteousness, do this and I can become righteous, versus the announcement righteous, believe what God has already done through Jesus. And right there in verse 9, if we back up a little bit, Paul talks about this. Righteousness of my own that comes from the law versus righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus. Righteousness from God. And those are the two approaches to God. And, and, And Here's the thing about this. Whenever I preach the gospel and I tell you the story of what God has done to save us, I know it's happening in some of your thoughts. Some of your thoughts are like, okay, Joe, you're saying that God forgives the unforgivable, that God justifies the unjustifiable, that God absolutely can receive and accept anyone, and that it doesn't matter what I do or how I live because Jesus is the one who did it. That's what you're saying to me. And the answer is yes. So the next, next, the next natural question is, so can I just do whatever I want then? Like, like if I'm good, can I live however I want? So if I'm absolutely forgiven, loved, and accepted, regardless of what I've done or what I will do, because of what Jesus has done for me, can I just keep on living like however I want? And, and to that, I would use a quote that Pastor J.D. Greer says. I think it's so helpful. He says, the gospel does not only answer the question, if you were to die today, what would happen to you? The gospel also answers the question, if you wake up tomorrow, how should you live? In other words, the story of Jesus doesn't only have implications for our past sins and the future one day when we die, but it has present power now, today, implications. It shapes and empowers how we live everyday life. So so, so no, you can't keep on doing what you used to do. Because the gospel changes you from the inside out. You have new affections and a new story that's shaping the way you live your life. The way you're encountering your neighbor. The way you're treating your spouse. The way you are as an employee or an employer. There are changes that happen deep in the heart of the person who understands what Jesus has actually accomplished. And, And maybe one way of getting at this is explaining a little bit of theology for you guys. Theology is a study of God, and, and there's a lot of benefit to really having an understanding of how God operates in Scripture. And here's one of them. Uh, a lot of confusion happens when we think of the idea of salvation, and we only think of it in terms of past tense or future tense. And what you need to know is there's actually three tenses of salvation. There's past tense salvation, I am saved. There is future tense salvation, I will be saved. And then there is present tense salvation, I am being saved. And it's a package deal. You can't just say, okay, my sins are forgiven and I get to go to heaven one day. Okay, that's, you can get both of those, but if you have both of those, you also have a, a present salvation that's working its way out in your life. We serve the God who was, past tense, who is, present tense, and who is to come, future. And, and because of that, our God has given us a salvation that covers all of our existence from, from past to future and even present. And so here's like the clearest way to understand this. You're trying to make this out in your head. The clearest way to understand it is we have been saved from the penalty of sin, past tense. What that means is that all the sins that we've racked up, all the sins that we've committed, uh, we have a debt accrued before God. God looks at our account and our status, and he says, okay, you're a sinner. You, you're not, you don't have that perfect record. You don't have access to a relationship with me. But through the death of my son, Jesus forgives you, wipes clean your record, and now you have a perfect record. You are counted in the eyes of God as if you were perfect. That's why we can look at one another and call us saints. And not like Catholic saints. You know, Catholic saints, you got to do all this special stuff, become a saint. But in the Bible, again and again, it says that you're a saint if you're in Jesus because he's given you his perfect record. That's amazing. But past tense, you are saved from the penalty of sin. This is a legal salvation where you are declared by God righteous. You you have this new status, this new label. You are accepted. At the moment of conversion, God saves you. Boom, right there in the spot. Boom, you're clean. 
And, and then there's this future salvation that we talk about where you will be saved. Or one day when you die, you will go to be with Jesus in heaven and sin will have no grip on you. The presence of sin will be gone. So if the penalty of sin is dealt with, here we're talking about the presence of sin. There will be no more sin, which is kind of unbelievable to think about. This is uh, what, what theologians call glorification. What it means is that your body will be raised in this new glorious body after death, and you're going to get this new legacy where you will be glorified. Your body will be raised to, to, to it, it will be unfading and unperishable, and you'll have this forever resurrected existence and eternal access to God himself. And then one day we're going to be in a perfect paradise with Jesus again forever. And we believe that, that the presence of sin will be wiped out, which... To me, it's just wild because I don't know what existence is like apart from sin, and neither do you. Like, there's times where I'm like, man, I wish I could love my wife the way I want to. I wish I could love my kids the way I want to. And, and I see progress in my life, but I'm not quite where I want to be. And it's exhausting to see the impact of my sin on the people that I love the most. And, and maybe you're like me and you feel exhausted sometimes and tired of how, man, I just wish I was better than I am currently. Jesus is going to get that done one day. Isn't that wild? And not only is he going to get that done, here's what's crazy, is sin has had ramifications on creation and you where things break down now. Like, we were not meant to die, but now we die because sin has entered the, ch the chat, right? And now things break down, we are perishable, we are perishable, our bodies are fading, our bodies are fading. Right, you guys feel that? I hit that at 30, man. Like, I'm telling you, I did the worm and I was like, for like three days after, right? Like, just, you know? And like, if, if, you, if you know what I'm talking about, our bodies are falling apart. And, and one day that won't be true. That will be undone. The Bible says we will be unperishable. You guys, you guys know that things die now. Things get old. I know this very well because my wife always makes me check the milk. You know what I mean? She hands me milk. She says, is it rotten? And I go, don't make me drink it. She goes, drink it. And I go, oh, it's rotten, right? It's yogurt. Um, it's perishing. There's a, one day there will be no expiring things, including your bodies. That's wonderful. It's amazing. Okay, got it. Past saved from the penalty. Future will be saved from the presence. But, but here's what we want to talk about today. You are present tense being saved from the power of sin. What this means is not just that you are in Jesus and you will be with Jesus, but that Jesus right now is in you, shaping your character to become like his. You are becoming like Jesus over your life. There's a moral progression in your life where a lifelong direction of discipleship where you are being transformed to become like Jesus, and that's part of his salvation. God is rescuing you from the person you used to be by making you into a brand new person today. This is a wonderful gift for people who are not quite what they wish they were. It's a wonderful gift of God to say, I have saved you from sin, forgiven you, and I am helping you to become like Jesus. I'm making you into a brand new person. The technical term for this is sanctification, but it's just the idea of the daily process of becoming like Jesus. We call it gospel transformation, which is God is doing a work in us to make us more like Jesus every single day of our life. If we wanted to give the answer, what is gospel transformation, the long answer would be, this is the Jesus-loving, spirit-empowered, cross-shaped, lifelong, heaven-focused journey of becoming like Jesus together. Okay, the Jesus-loving, spirit-empowered, cross-shaped, lifelong, heaven-focused journey of becoming like Jesus together. And we see each of those things I just said right there in this passage. And, and what I'm trying to get you to see throughout our time together today is how, um, how do we, what is it to be transformed as a Christian? What does a Christian life entail, right? What is it to experience transformation personally? Yes, I've been saved from my sins in the past. Yes, I will be saved one day. But what does it look like to actually be a Christian and to experience daily uh, transformation in the day in and day out, everyday stuff of life? Well, the first thing you got to know is about the gospel person. It's all about Jesus. We, we need to know that to become transformed is to love and value Jesus. And, and you see that right away in verse 8. Paul says, everything in my past that I had, all the good things, I count them as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. He goes on to say, I, I, I want to gain Christ in my life. I want to be found in him. I want to know him. I want to become like him. 
Now, earlier in verse 7, Paul says he talked about his past and how he was kind of excelling morally and, and culturally and just his social status was skyrocket high and he was this great Bible scholar and he knew so much and performed so much, had a great family heritage. And he says, all of that, nothing, because it got in the way of getting to know Jesus. All right, so he says, I counted all of my past as nothing in comparison to getting Jesus. But then verse 8, something happens. He doesn't just say, I counted my past, past tense. Then he says, and now I count all things lost. In other words, right now in the present, Paul says, I'm still learning to look at my life and say nothing matters but knowing and having Jesus. That those good things become dangerous things because I'm willing to put my trust in them rather than in Jesus. So in a sense, they're actually a net loss. They're, they're actually dangerous liabilities. And so last week we talked about this. Your abilities are liabilities when they distract you from Jesus. And, and so if I could just simplify this, if you want to talk about what does it mean to be a Christian and to grow and change and slowly see your character shaped and formed, it starts to just having a relationship. It starts with loving Jesus. There's no way around this. There's no becoming obedient apart from knowing and loving Jesus. Like, becoming obedient apart from a Jesus-loving relationship is what the Pharisees were guilty of. And so if I give you 10 tips and strategies and doctrines and truths about how to become a better person, but I don't center it in a personal relationship with Jesus, I will make you twice the son of hell because you will look good on the outside, but you won't have the affection that God wants you to have for Jesus. And so a lot of times as Christians, we talk a lot about what we're doing for Christ and what we need to recalibrate our lives around is being with Christ. We we need to recalibrate our lives around cherishing, enjoying, and loving Jesus. Because when you spend time with someone, you start acting like them. You start acting like them. Again, my daughter is such a clear picture of this. I love that little girl, man. But when she starts hanging out with certain people, she starts acting like them, good or bad. She's really polite with some friends. And then when her cousins come around, she drops the F-bomb. That's right. That happened. (laughs) I was sitting there, and she don't even know what it means, right? She said, what the? And I said, hmm? And she looked at me, and she said, I'm not supposed to say that word? And I was like, no. And her cousin said, I don't know where she got it from. (laughs) I do. (laughs) And then he said, I used to say it, but I don't anymore. I'm like, you're five, bro. Like, what do you mean I used to? I got a pass. Like, come on, dude. I don't trust you, man. Took him out back, had to rough him up, teach him a lesson, you know? <laughs> it was so funny, man. But not funny, you know? But funny. Um, you spend time with someone, you start acting like them, good or bad, right? Right? Hey, here's Jesus' like, pro tip. You want to become like Jesus? Spend time with them. Like, that's literally what Jesus says. Jesus says, Um, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't do anything if you're not with me. And so his number one tip for transformation, simple, one word, ready? Listen, lean in, here it is, it's a secret, okay? Abide. Stay close. He says, imagine a branch. It, It needs to be connected to the tree trunk for it to get vitality and life and nutrients. He says, if you break off that branch, it's no longer gonna get life. He says, that's you. Don't be a dead branch disconnected from the tree trunk. Get your life connected. Abide. Abide. Stay close. Remain in. Soak in. Be near. Connect close, right? And so maybe one way of thinking about this is like, have you guys ever washed the dishes and you're trying really hard to get out the, you know, those, and then, and then you, you just actually can just put it to soak in soapy water and leave it there for a couple hours and come back and suddenly the thing you were trying so hard with elbow grease to get out is really easy to get off, right? Because it's soaked. And Jesus says there's sins in our life that we're trying so hard by our own strength to get out. But if you just take a beat to soak and abide and be connected to me, if you prioritize being with Jesus, you would become like Jesus. That's what I'm saying. Because you start to act like the ones that you're around. And so let's just start by talking about how it's all about Jesus. Second thing, it's all God's power. Look at verse 10. 
Paul says, I want to know him. There's that relational part, right? And I want to know the power of his resurrection. Later on in verse 12, uh, Paul says, look it, I'm not perfect, but I'm working towards that. And he says, and I'm doing it because Jesus has made me his own. In other words, the only reason I'm taking steps of obedience towards Jesus is because Jesus took steps towards me. In other words, this is God's work empowering your work, and specifically, it's the power of his resurrection. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the grave. Bodily, historically, it changed the game. And one of the things it changed is it changed our ability to obey him. Before, trying by the law, we could never do it. But now we have a new life and new power. And we have been, uh, who are Christians, have experienced what the Bible would call a resurrection power, which means you cannot give up. You cannot resign because of the resurrection. And honestly, sometimes you want to. Sometimes you're like, man, I wish I could just walk away from Jesus and do my own thing. But you can't even enjoy that anymore because you know too much. It's like someone's chasing you because someone has made you their own. That experience of not being able to resign to the areas of your life is the power of the resurrection. Because Jesus has the power, the undeniable power to transform things in radical ways. Number one, the cross. I mean, we wear it like jewelry now, but in the day of Jesus, the cross was a horrifying torture device. It was used to torture people into submission under the Roman emperor and his empire. The whole point of the cross was horror and curse and wrath of God. That's what people saw. They looked at that and said, oh, God hates that person. They looked at that person and said, oh, that person's been judged by the empire. Oh, that person's being crossed up because they crossed the empire. Now they are under the rule of the, the, the Caesar, the lord of that empire. And Jesus comes to the cross and empties of it of its power by resurrecting from the grave. The cross doesn't have power, and now we wear it around our neck like it's cute. And we wear it on our biceps like we're cool because no one's scared of the cross anymore because Jesus emptied it of its death power. He has defied death, and in defying death, he's defied tyrants who deal in death. And in doing that, he's reversed the power of the cross. So now when you look at the cross, your first thought is an oh, horror, shame, wrath, but love, hope, beauty, life. How did we take the worst torture device of death and transform it into a symbol of life and hope? Oh, we didn't do it. Jesus did it. And so if Jesus can take the cross utterly transform it to mean something new? You don't think he could do that with your marriage? Or with your child who's wayward? Or with your situation that seems backwards and upside down? Or of the parts of your heart that say, I can't forgive that person? Or the parts of your story that seem unredeemable? Jesus, when he gets into your life, there's an undeniable power that's unleashed where you begin to become transformed. And, and part of that is you have the durability to endure anything because you know he's made you his own no matter what you're coming across. And, and I need you to hear that the power of transformation is not just addition of knowledge. Sometimes you come to church and you, you, you hear a lot of things, so you think, okay, um, what I need is to get more knowledge or to apply the knowledge I have. We're not talking about education. We're talking about transformation. You don't need new education. You need a new life. I'm not saying that you don't use your brain as a Christian. Of course you do. I love the Bible. I love studying Scripture. Like, I'm serious about the study of Scripture, but I'm saying is it's more than just new education or new rituals or new rules or new... It, it's a new life that Jesus is affecting you by his resurrection. And it changes everything. It absolutely changes everything. There's a book I would recommend called Unlikely Converts by Randy Newman. And it's a series of um, just stories that he tells of people who are just so unlikely, such unlikely converts. For instance, this one girl named Joni who grew up in a cult where the leader convinced them that they were the Messiah. And she ends up running away from that, going off to college, and basically getting into as much trouble as you think a young girl throwing off religion would get into at college. And she, she, she finally... Um, comes to meet some people at a Bible study, and she hates religion and wants nothing to do with it, but somehow, slowly, even against her own will, she says it oftentimes, she feels compelled towards Jesus because of the kindness of these people who are gradually, kindly, patiently pointed towards Christ. And eventually, through the gospel, she realizes that she didn't love, she, she hated the wrong God, that the real God loved her and had a plan for her and that Jesus had forgiven her of her sins. And there's this beautiful moment in the book where she says, I'd done all these mistakes. I'd screwed up on so many levels. 
and to be totally and wholly forgiven by these things by a God? That was a huge experience for me. So she begins to cry, and so does the man who's with her interviewing her. And then she whispered, the word gratitude doesn't even begin to describe it. Like, the person burned out on religion, there's a place for you at Jesus' table. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. Don't let the church burn Jesus. Don't let, don't, don't let what they did be something that Jesus did. Or another woman named Erica, she grew up atheist and agnostic. And she tells a story where she had no interest. She had a great life. She was homecoming queen, straight-A student, you know, really happy, full life. And she went off to college and had the same kind of great, happy, successful life. And one day, her family said, we're going to Paris for vacation after her first college summer break. And she said, so I took the Bible. And the guy looked at her and said, why? She said, I don't know. I just did. It was weird. I didn't have religious friends. Someone gave me a Bible as a gift. Oh, I'll take it and read it. And she says, I didn't even like it. I read it. Every day when I was out there, I didn't get it. Didn't make sense to me. I don't even remember what I read. She says, and then when I got back to college, I don't know why, but I sought out a Bible study. I knew a girl who was kind of Christian. She said, hey, you're a Christian. Can I go with you to your Bible study? No one invited her. She said, can I go with you? Right? And she did. And then she heard a message about how Christianity was reasonable and there was actually good verifiable historical reasons to believe in it. And she was compelled and she had questions. And for, for two and a half months, she began to meet with this lady and just na- work through all of her questions. And what's crazy about this is she said, this girl had a horrible life. And she struggled with insecurity and her life was empty. And so when she came to Christ, it was like, well, Christ is everything I've been missing. She goes, but I had a great life and my life was nothing like hers. But Jesus was still compelling to me. And she describes it as weird or random or quite unexplainable But over the course of time, one day, she realizes Jesus really is God. And he really did forgive her her sins. And just like that, she's transformed. She's saved. Here's the point. If you are coming from no church background, or you're coming from this weird, cultish, religious background, or something in between that, there's space for you at Jesus' table. Because it's not about what you've done or what you haven't done. It's about whether or not you can believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he did what he said he did. The third thing about transformation is it's cross-shaped. Paul says in verse 10, I don't want to just know Jesus. I don't want to just share in his power. I want to share his sufferings and become like him in his death. To become a Christian and to be formed by Christ is to be formed in the way of the cross. Later on, Paul will pick this up again and say, Brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. There are others, who I've often told you, and now I'm even telling you with tears, who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Here's what he says. He says, there's basically um, two ways of living. The way of the crown or the way of the cross. The way of the crown is to live for your own glory, for your own pleasure, for your own comfort, for your own love, for your own acceptance. The way of the the crown is to, to live for yourself, in effect. And you can do that through religion or rebellion. The point is, the way of the crown is about you. And he said, but the way of the cross is about waking up every day, every day, and dying to yourself so you would live to God and live for others. And and Paul's been actually um, kind of using this theme all throughout the book of Philippians. In in chapter 2, he he has this beautiful poem. Remember we talked about it? About the God who had all glory and might and power and beauty and, and, and comes from heaven to earth that he might become a human being who identifies with us. And not just any human being, but a servant. And not just any servant, but a servant who would die. And not just any death, but death by cross. The most humiliating, low, despicable, shameful kind of death. And Paul tells and weaves this beautiful story of how God became man, that he would live among us and be with us, and how he's accessible to all people because he's so humble. And he talks about the humiliation of God in his descending to us. And then Paul picks up that theme and says, by the way, that's what it means to be a Christian. And he starts giving examples. Paul says, for instance, my own ministry in life is like I'm pouring myself out. The same way Jesus poured himself out for people, I pour myself out for you guys, he says. And then he talks about this other guy who he's mentoring in the faith named Timothy. He says, Timothy, man, I don't know anyone who has the genuine concern that he has for other people. He pours himself out for others, really interested in taking care of people. And I'm sending him to you, Philippi. And then he talks about this guy named Epaphroditus, who was the guy who originally sent a... um, 
a gift to Paul from Philippi to Paul. And he says, this guy almost died in delivering that gift. He nearly died. He, he gave himself. We've got to honor that. We've got to honor people who live their lives shaped by the cross, which is to empty yourself of all glory, to empty yourself of your resume, of your gain, of anything you think you have, and to say it's all for God's credit and the good of others. And Paul says this even himself in verse 13. He says, I forget what lies behind me. What lies behind Paul? What is it that is in Paul's past? We all got stuff in our past, but what's Paul's past that he says, I just forget it. It's not what you'd think. It's not like Paul, um, you know, was sleeping around and getting drunk every weekend, right? Paul, his religious past was he was a self-righteous bigot, right? He thought Israel was better than everybody, and he was just mean and nasty. And he was moral, he did it with a smile on his face. He was a Bible guy. That was Paul's past. But he used the Bible and his superiority of Israel, all those things to hurt people, to harm people. And he's shamed by what should have been glorious and gainful in that culture. He's shamed by it. And he says, I just want to forget my resume because my resume was a distraction from Jesus. Paul says, I got to empty myself of the good things I thought I had. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. Christianity isn't only repenting of the bad things you've done. It's repenting of the good things you trust in. Christianity is not only repenting of the bad things you've done. It's repenting of the good things that you trust in instead of Jesus. Paul says, I got to forget all that. I got to go to the cross and just divest myself of, of, of anything that I think I bring to the table because the truth is, those can often become the things that distract me from loving and wanting Jesus. Here's the point. To be a Christian, to be transformed as a Christian, is to begin to say, I will go through or give up anything. The Christian life is the way of the cross. It is the way of the cross. And so what does that mean? That means becoming like Jesus is hard. In this life, you will have many troubles, Jesus said. No one ever leveled with us like Jesus, right? Like Jesus wasn't trying to pitch us his life. He wasn't trying to sell us on becoming a follower. He wasn't saying, oh, you better do it, please. I'll miss you in heaven if you don't come. He doesn't do any of that. He said, man, you got to think about it. It's really hard. Following me is hard. You got to count the cost, measure it up, make sure you want to do this. I don't know. Why? Because Jesus leveled with us. He looked us straight in the eyes and said, listen, it's going to cost you everything. It'll cost you your very life. And then he says, but it's worth it. You decide. Paul picks up on this language and says, I press on to the prize. I press on. That word press, same word that was used in verse 6 when Paul described his persecution of the church. So if you don't know the story of Paul, hated the church, hated Christians, used to kill them for fun, right? That was like his gig, you know what I mean? Um, Religious zealot just would use religion to hurt people and harm people. Paul says, I used to press the church. And now I press myself for Jesus. I want to press on. In other words, there's something violent about becoming transformed. Because it requires a certain kind of death and a certain kind of new life that can only happen through death to self. It's painful. It's difficult. There's there's difficulty in walking the way of the cross. Sometimes we get saved. We come to Jesus and we experience this conversion and things are great. We've been relieved of our guilt. Enter into this new wonderful community. We're learning so many things. It's so exciting. And then life sets in and, and we're like, man, it's hard. Like, is it supposed to be this hard? Am I doing it wrong? Like, what if you experience the hardness as not a, a bug but a feature of your Christianity? What if you realized that if it's hard, it's the way of the cross? That's why a lot of people don't love because it's hard. It's sacrificial. It's costly. It's difficult to stay committed, to show up when you don't want to, to be there for people who can be exhausting. It's difficult. It is tiring. It's the way of the cross. There's something violent about coming to God and saying, I'm going to die to myself. Whatever you want, I will do. Whatever you want me to be, I will become. One of the the clearest um, transformation stories I've heard of is by a woman named Rosaria Butterfield. She talks about being the chair of um, English uh, of literature at Syracuse, and she had just gotten tenured, and she ran the LGBTQ kind of um, program at that school, and she herself was a, a, a lesbian in a relationship with one, and she talks about the wrestling match of that identity that she's so closely identified with and so loved, and it felt so right and natural and good to her. 
And over the course of several years where she had a relationship with a pastor who was so kind and patient and, and humble and accessible and hospitable to her, she begins to wrestle with this. And, and she basically comes to terms with this idea is, if I'm really going to come to Christ, it has to be on his terms and it's going to require a death of me. And here's what she also says, by the way. She says, that's everyone, by the way. Everyone pays the same price to become a Christian. There's no one who doesn't have to die before coming to Christ. There's no one who's like, okay, you're actually pretty good. Let's just add Jesus to what you already got going on, right? That person doesn't exist. The person born in, in the baptistry, been to VBS their whole lives, and, 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 you know, their first words were Greek, right? Agape. That baby, okay, that baby needs to die and have new life the same as this woman who's a liberal, progressive, openly practicing homosexual woman. Here's how she describes her own violence of transformation. She says, one ordinary day, I came to Jesus open-handed and naked. In this war of worldviews, my pastor was there. His wife was there. The church that had been praying for me for years was there. Jesus triumphed. I was broken. Conversion was a train wreck. I did not want to lose everything I loved. But the voice of God sang a sanguine song of love in the rubble of my world. I weakly believed that if Jesus could conquer death, he could make my world right. I drank tentatively at first, then passionately of the solace of the Holy Spirit. I rested in private peace, then community, and today in the shelter of a covenant family where one calls me wife and many call me mother. I have not forgotten the blood Jesus surrendered for this life. And my former life lurks in the edges of my heart, shiny and still like a knife. Something violent and painful about having to come and say, I'm going to come under the cross, whatever that requires of me. If that requires my self-justifying religious toxicity, I'm going to give it up. If it requires the greed that, that, that makes me work more than I ought, I'm going to give it up. If it requires my identifying features, I'm going to give it up. Whatever I got to pay to gain Christ, I will count it as loss because that is the point of Christianity. It's a cross-shaped experience. Number four, you need to know it's a process. Paul says, by any means possible, I want to attain the resurrection for the dead. And I haven't obtained this. I'm not already perfect, but I'm pressing on to make it my own because Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it my own. It's a lifelong process. You never arrive. The Christian who has arrived doesn't get it. They haven't arrived. If you think you've arrived, you are proud. Paul is not perfect. So neither are you and I. I mean, Paul wrote the Bible. Can you put that on your resume? Right? He visited heaven, okay? Have you been there? He didn't even write a book. You know bestsellers for him on this one, all right? Paul did amazing things, planted churches, preached. He was one of the original apostolic messengers of Jesus. And when he looks at his life, he's like, oh, I'm not there yet. Can, does that comfort you? That comforts me. That comforts me that if Paul's not there, I'm not going to be there. And so one way of thinking about this, Martin Luther says, you know, repentance is the entire Christian life. All of life is repentance. That's not just how we come to Christ. It's how we stay and grow in Christ. Christian maturity is needing Jesus more, not less. And we don't repent to keep God happy because that's self-centered and self-righteous. We repent because we are deeply aware of our need and deeply aware of God's provision. And so to repent is to turn from yourself to your Savior as an acknowledgement, I need something beyond myself to rescue me. And, and the lifelong process of repentance is the Christian life. And so, so I hope the Gateway's leadership are leaders of repentance. They are humble, willing to name the places where they messed up and call it what it is and show in their repentance leadership. I hope that men are leaders in their homes of repentance. That they're not dominating and throwing their weight around and expecting the others to repent first. Because the truth is, to be a Christian is to be a repenter. I hope that you understand that repentance is all of life. That's what makes the earlier people Paul was talking about, the dogs, the evil workers, the, the evildoers, the mutilators of the flesh. Remember verse 2? Those religious people who are pushing performance on people? That's what makes them so dangerous, is they convince you that you got to perform and be enough when the truth is, the gospel is you aren't enough, but Jesus is, and if you would acknowledge that, you would actually be transformed by that. 
That's why it's so dangerous. That's why the law is so crushing. But to be a repenter is to be like Psalm 32. This is how it describes it. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. I groaned all day, day and night. It felt like a hand was upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. You guys ever spent five minutes out in the valley in summer? Your heat, that heat dries up your strength, right? I go to Walmart, I come back, I worked a full day today. You know what I mean? I was with the people of Walmart, right? Because it just drying up my strength. My, and, 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 then, and then the psalmist says, but then I acknowledged my sin. I didn't cover it up. I said, I'm going to confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave me. And he says, and man, I felt so relieved. I hope that when you come to church, you come in limping and you leave leaping. I hope that when you come to church, you come in burdened and you leave unburdened. I hope when you come to church, you have a sense of your need and you leave with a sense of his provision. Because the point of the gospel is to give yourself to the one who's provided for you. Now that's part of it. The other part of this is, is to, when Paul says you're not, you know, he's not there yet. What that also means is, if you're feeling really crushed by your sin right now, you're looking at your life and you're like, man, I'm not where I want to be. Don't give up. Don't resign. You're his. You are imperfect, but you're also in process. So stop being surprised by that. When you hear yourself say, I'm imperfect, replace it with, I'm in process. Because that is going to help you to understand the Father's heart towards you. God is your Father, and he's proud of your efforts. Just don't quit. Keep going, all right? Um, so my kids, uh, one of my kids anyways, made this for me. Okay, I think this was olives. I was trying to get Theo's because Theo's was considerably worse. They made this for me. They are not in the lines, right? Like, look at that. It's all the lines. You got some color coding issues, right? Like, you know, her. it's just, it, at least she chose red for the heart. Like, this is my daughter's. And when she gave this to me, I didn't look at it and go, that's trash. You didn't stay in the lines. Like, that wasn't like my heart for her. My heart was Oh my gosh, this is like Van Gogh. This is the greatest, it's abstract. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. I love dad, I love Olive, right? And then I put it in our special place where we keep these things, the trash can. I'm just playing. Um, I'm just playing. What do you do with these things, right? Am I right? Um, no, I loved it, man. I loved it because, you know, my fatherly heart for her wasn't in the ways she messed up, in the ways she was trying to bring pleasure to my heart. That's the heart of the father for you. He doesn't look at you and say, why won't you get it right? That might have been your dad. That might have been your mom. And maybe you've internalized that voice. And mom, that might be your voice. But look at me. The father does not have that posture towards you. He knows it's a lifelong process. When the prodigal son, you guys know that story? Kid asks his dad for inheritance, spends it on prostitute and partying, decides to come home. He's rehearsing his apology. He's terrified of what might happen. And you know, the father doesn't wait for him and say, okay, when's this kid going to come home? He's not arms crossed, looking at him way off. The Bible says he has compassion on him, and he runs to him because the heart of the Father is to give you kindness before you give him repentance. It is God's kindness that leads to repentance, not the other way around. Some of you think that you're repenting of your sin so that God will start loving you. That's wrong. The Bible says God's already loved you, and that's why you should repent. God's kindness is what leads us to our repentance. And so if you're feeling broken by some of the stuff you got going on, I mean, hear this good news. While we were still weak, Jesus died for us. God chose his love for us, and while we were still sinners, he died for us. While we were enemies, how much will he love us now that we're friends and family? It's a process. Uh, if you keep saying to yourself, man, I'm so imperfect, change that. I am in process. And here's the last thing you need to know. It's also about progress. And so we're not looking for perfection, but we are looking for direction. What is the general direction of your life? Is it oriented towards transformation? Look what Paul says. Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling God in Jesus Christ. This is like a running metaphor. And what he's saying is, man, I'm just running the race. I'm running the race. And he says, I'm not looking at my past. I'm not looking at myself. I'm looking forward at my pride, which is Jesus and the glory that I'll receive with him. 
My eyes are focused on the prize. Eyes on the prize, not self. Forget your past. Forget the shame. Forget the guilt. Forget the things you did that didn't measure up. Throw that in your past. Paul says, if you're running and you're in first place, how many of you are looking back to see? That, that's not a good runner. Keep your eyes focused on where you're headed, not where you've been. Or don't, don't keep them on yourself even. For every look you put on yourself, put 10 on your Savior. Because the truth is we're never enough. We know that. But that's not the point, because he is. I mean, one of my favorite images of this is Kevin Costner shared this at Whitney Houston's funeral that uh, when she was like at the height of her fame, right? Like she's just killing like that moment, you know what I mean? Killing it. Everyone's like, Whitney's on fire. And she uh, was casted for the bodyguard. There was a moment where they were um, going to start filming and no one knew where Whitney's. Where's Whitney? Where's Whitney? Where's Whitney? Kevin said, I'll go look in her dressing room. So he did. When he knocked, he heard her whimpering. And he opened the door and said, Whitney, can I come in? And he found her like a little girl huddled up in front of a mirror asking, am I enough? Am I enough? Are they going to love me? What are they going to think of me? What are they going to think of me? I mean... It's wild that the people that we look up to, celebrities, people who we honor and think, man, they must have it all together. They must feel so confident because they're so beautiful. They're so together, so rich, they're so likable, they're so great. That they themselves are looking in the mirror saying, am I enough, am I enough, am I enough, am I enough? What if we could look beyond the mirror to the Messiah and see that he's enough and that means we're okay? That's what Paul says. Paul says, get your eyes focused on the prize. Get your eyes focused on the prize. There's going to be suffering. Yeah, there is. That's, Paul's, in cha- Paul's writing this letter in chains, by the way. He's chained to some big guard in Rome. All right, it's very uncomfortable. And his eyes are on the prize. Not on the price, but the prize. Hebrews 12 says it this way. The, uh, it says, we're surrounded by so many witnesses who ran this race. So let's lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let's run the race set before us with endurance, looking to Jesus, the one who started and perfects our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He seated at the right hand of God. Here's what the Bible says. It says, stop running with baggage in your arms. Whether it's your past or it's distractions or you got going, so you're running with baggage. So, I mean, some of us are running the race, and instead of running with freedom, we're running like this. We're running the mile, you know, and we're like, why can't I get any, why can't I get a faster time? Because you got baggage you're carrying. And Paul says, just put down the baggage and run. Okay, what's in this suitcase? Daddy issues and your cousin curses. Got it, Olive. Um, okay, well, you know, what, what's in this one? You, you got some, some, some mental health issues. Okay, what, 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 let's just, those are real. We could talk about them, right? We could talk about them, we could deal with them. You, you guys know me as a counselor, as a pastor. I love to work through this stuff with people. But Paul says, man, if you're so self-focused on what you're not, you're going to miss what Jesus is. If you're so self-focused on what's wrong in you, you're going to miss what's right about him. Paul says if you're so self-focused on your past, you're going to miss the prize. It's hard. It's a cross. But guess what comes after the cross? The crown. The crown comes after the cross for those who will look beyond themselves to Jesus. And that's why he finally, finally gets to this point. He says this. He says, people who are enemies of the cross... They only think about now. Their mindset is earthly. Their mindset dictates their lifestyle. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things. I got a lot to say, but here's what I will say. (laughs) Um, This place, Philippi, It was basically a bunch of retired military veterans. What happened was when Rome conquered, uh, there was a bunch of like uprisings of different people who tried to rebel. And so Rome sent military veterans to kind of stop the revolutions. And when they stopped, they settled down and they made those places that they were at colonies. Philippi was one of those colonies. They were very proud Roman citizens. And the point of being a Roman citizen wasn't, hey, come back to Rome. and and be a citizen of Rome in Rome. The point was not bring your citizenship back home. The point of being a citizen in Philippi was we're an outpost. We are living out our citizenship in Philippi, not back there. 
that we're bringing citizenship to bear in this space, this is why this is essential. Because what a lot of us hear when we hear uh, your citizenship is in heaven, what we hear is I just need to wait till I get to die and go up there somewhere with God. That's not what this is talking about. When it says your citizenship is in heaven, it's saying right now you're a citizen of heaven, which means you're supposed to colonize the world with heavenly culture. The prayer that Jesus prayed at the Lord's Prayer was on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, Jesus is Lord and King now in the everyday stuff of life. His kingdom is reigning right now through his church. Right now, earth is being colonized with heavenly glory and what we call here at our church, gospel culture. So when people meet us, there should be something of God's beauty and wonder in us manifesting to them. And when we gather, it should be like an embassy of the ambassador. We should be ambassadors in an embassy pointing to the future kingdom together. When he says your citizenship is in heaven, you shouldn't think, oh, great, I can't wait to get there. You should think, how do I live out that citizenship right now? Because I've read the end of the Bible, and the end of the Bible is not we go to heaven, but that heaven comes down to earth. And that Jesus resurrects us, and that he resurrects the earth, and that he makes us together to live with him forever. There's a lot of theological systems that make the point of Christianity to get out of earth, to escape earth, to go somewhere else. But God loves the earth because he made the earth. And he doubled down on that love when he became part of creation in the incarnation. And then he tripled down on it when he resurrected a human body and said, I'm in this forever. And then he just said, you know what, let's just make this forever. When he promises to make heaven come down to earth and make all things new. That is the hope of the Christian. So to progress as a Christian is to live out heavenly citizenship every day of our lives. That's transformation as Christians. It's living under Jesus' lordship, his kingship, in everyday life. That you become an ambassador in your marriage, as a dad, as a mom, in your workspace, as a neighbor. The way that you vote, the way that you think about life, it's all radically transformed by the values of heaven and not the values of earth. Because if your mind is set on the temporal, on the now, and what's in front of you, you're not living out that cross-centered life. You're not going to get the crown. The, the end of Jesus is exaltation, resurrection, ascension. And the end of the Christian, similarly with him, is exaltation, ascension, and glory. And that's what we keep our eyes on. We keep our eyes on the prize because he's worth it.